This is not a drama, it's real. The story of how a police investigation finally brought a rapist and pornographer to justice. There's some strong language and graphic descriptions as BBC Two examines the anatomy of a crime. Wilmslow, Cheshire, just south of Manchester. Population 30,000. Affluent, sophisticated, respectable. It's a place where ladies lunch, where their husbands push babies in buggies, and where a car can cost more than five times the average wage. It's not the kind of place where police come knocking at 6.30 in the morning. Mr. Kane, yeah. from Greater Manchester Police. Can I come in another word? Thanks. Hi, Ed, from the police. Just come down, you probably hear what's going on. I'm um, Detective Sergeant Andy Meeks, I'm from the Cold Case Unit, Greater Manchester Police. You know, following me under arrest on suspicion of a number of offences which took place in Altringham in 1994, okay. including indecent assault, false imprisonment, attempted buggery, and rape. <gasps> Wow. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which will later on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Oh, what's that? What's this? So we'll have to take Buggery. that to the police station. Oh, we'll what, what? 19 what? 1994. 1994. You come down to the police station. Wait a minute. Right now oh, Jesus Christ. What is it for? What's it for? I don't know, we just don't know. What's it for? Right, well, we'll we need to start that out down at the police station. Oh, Can you just get your shoes on? Alright. Nice and smooth. Nice and smooth, obviously, he's denying it. But I think you would, wouldn't you, really? Because you're hitting him with sort of, you know, deviancy. And then, yeah, it will come as a shock. It's not something you're going to readily admit, is it? The realisation, ten years on, you've been caught for something you've done then. Mm. Can you get the camera away from me? Come on, I get the camera This will be a little bit of talking in this leafy suburb. Thanks a lot, lads. Good job. Just after nine o'clock on the September evening, and once again, it's a make the most of it. I'm sure it won't be long before. yourself up with a loved one by the fire. Get you in the mood. Here's a track that's been at number one for 13 weeks. Oh, lucky for some, I hear you say, yes, it's wet, wet, wet. I feel it in my The arrest of Brian Keane was for the brutal rape of a prostitute ten years earlier. We'll call the woman Jane, and she's given us her permission to tell the story of that night. 
She was picked up from a street corner in the Wally Range area of South Manchester on the night of the 7th of September 1994 and taken to the Pelican Hotel in Altrincham. Her client then subjected her to a prolonged sexual assault, keeping her prisoner for over four hours and telling her that he was videotaping everything. Although semen was found on a towel left in the room, DNA technology was in its infancy and the crime remained undetected. But when DNA technology advanced, the Forensic Science Service re-examined the unsolved rapes and serious sexual assaults in their archives. This is where we store files of all the, the past cases that we've done. We would normally keep major unsolved crimes, such as unsolved rapes, murders, things of that nature, for a minimum of 30 years. Um, and even then, after 30 years, we actually review whether or not we keep them. The government project was called Operation Advance, and one of the samples the FSS chose to reanalyse was from the Pelican Hotel. This is one of the towels that was taken from the room. The blue areas here are areas where we detected semen staining on it. That's the original findings in there. Further work was done on the, on the semen, and we obtained a DNA profile using the techniques that are, are available today, and that enabled us to um, run that profile against the, the DNA database. The National DNA Database contains profiles from more than three million people and now everyone who is arrested may be added to it. When the FSS checked their new profile against the database, they found a match, Brian Paul Keane. Eight months before his arrest, Keane's name is handed over to the police in Manchester. We've spoken to Mike Smith, who's the organisation's internal communications manager. He's done a summary for us, gives a message regarding some of our issues, certainly for sexual offences and also for homicides that may be out there on divisions that we need to actually capture. The man in charge of the cold case review unit is Detective Inspector Jeff Arnold. But just because Keane's been identified as a suspect, it doesn't mean that he's committed any crime. What we try and do is build the case to see if it's viable. We don't revisit uh, the victims at all. We would only consider approaching those victims if we felt we had a viable case. Some of the difficulties with these older cases is actually finding the old case papers. On occasions, they've actually been destroyed. The officer who'll manage this case is Detective Sergeant Andy Meeks. He's already discovered that Keane is known to the police. His DNA was taken as a result of a, a road rage incident which was involved in, in Cheshire in uh, 2001. Um, if it hadn't been for that incident, his DNA would have never been taken and obviously it had never come to light for this offence. So quite fortunate, really. One of the problems the cold case unit faces is that they have a suspect but know very little about the attack at the Pelican Hotel. Force policy in the 90s was to keep information about rapes for just five years. Well, at Altrincham Police Station, there was nothing left at all. There were no case papers. Fortunately, the Forensic Science Service had maintained a comprehensive file that contained a copy of the victim's statement, and that's where we got the bulk of our material from. There were still some documents which we were able to retrieve from the Force archive, such as an EFIT record, which was stored at the imaging unit, and also some of the electronic records, such as the incident log and the crime report. Although the police have no witness statements, they've traced the detective who was first on the scene. I specifically remember the job, mainly because it was quite unusual. The girl was uh, held there against her will. I specifically remember it because I'd worked on Vice for several years at Moss Side before. Right. And I always found if we got a prostitute reporting rape, 
there was normally a real job in it. Tended to be genuine. Yeah, yeah because yeah. the working girls didn't yeah. report rate. There's no point. Mm. It, it loses them business time, etc. Yeah. So usually, if a working girl reports that she's been raped, mm -hmm. there's a job in it. Can you remember actually dealing with the the girl on the night? The complaint. I can't. No. No. I or can't. have you had any previous dealings with her? No. Would you have any other material yourself which you might still have? It may have been because I was moving police stations. Mm. I actually did make an entry in a pocketbook. Mm -hmm. If I did, that will help me greatly, so I'll try and find that for you. OK. I've got to serve any new material by sort of mid next week, so I know you're busy. Right. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll turn it around. As soon as you can. Cheers. The documents in the FSS file also contain details of Jane's confidential examination at the Sexual Assault Referral Centre at St Mary's Hospital in Manchester. So this is the way that the police would bring somebody into the centre. Um, they would transport the client down to the hospital and then into the examination suite. This is the room where the crisis worker would bring the victim. One of the first things that we ask is that they understand why they're here, so that they understand that they're going to have a forensic medical examination. And the process here between the crisis worker and the client can take anything from 10 minutes to an hour and a half. And it's only when the client is ready that the doctor then comes in to start taking down information that will assist in the forensic medical examination. She was a pale, thin young woman with long, wavy, fair hair. She had poor skin with a number of pustules and spots and moderate acne on her face. She had tattoos on her arms and legs and marks of old and recent intravenous drug abuse. She looked very shocked, quiet and lost. She was complaining of pain in her stomach and vagina. There was a slight bruise inside the upper lip. There was a faint red mark two centimetres by two centimetres in front of the left wrist. The pubic hair had been patchily removed, quite unlike anything that a woman would do to herself, and I have never seen a similar case. This finding very strongly supports the account given by Miss X. Ian Greenhouse has found his pocketbook, which contains a first-hand account of the events that night. When I located this, and it told me that the first call I'd had that evening for a job of any serious note was 5.35 in the morning. And that had been a report of a rape that was made by a female victim, a working girl, at Moss Side Police Station. The pocketbook reminded me that I'd taken her back to the Pelican Hotel. Then she described how they approached the hotel. This man parked his car in a side road away from the hotel when there was ample parking right next to the rooms. So that registered with me. That was potentially someone trying to evade the car being caught on CCTV. The Pelican Hotel is not the nearest hotel to where the victim was collected from. However, most of them are accessed via the foyer. And as you walk through the foyer of most hotels, there's usually CCTV. The Pelican Hotel was quite different because it was more like a, a motel. You can go direct to your room across the car park. And the third thing she told me was that as soon as she got in the room, this man grabbed something like tape that was pre-cut and put it over her, her mouth or her eyes, which effectively meant that there'd been a real element of planning within the hotel room to get things ready. As the case comes together, the police still haven't let Jane know that Keane's been identified or asked if she's prepared to give evidence against him. They need to consult the Crown Prosecution Service to find out if the case is strong enough to go to court before they intrude into her life. In view of the seriousness of the case, there's no issue about the public interest factor. So the focus of our attention is whether we have got uh, a case that we can present, a case that we can strengthen in, in any way. Even though the complainant is a prostitute, she made a very powerful statement of complaint. Yes. I find, when reading that, a very credible account. My own view is that here is a good case. The DNA is from the towel used to wipe her face after ejaculation. 
uh, and this occurred in the hotel room. Whether it's possible to get a statement from the hotel, if they can give you some evidence as to the sort of towels that they had at the time, I don't know. It'd be... Made preliminary efforts to trace the members of staff who were there at the time, and it's not been that straightforward. What we don't want is, is some issue that he has masturbated yeah, and left the sample on mm -hmm. the towel, and then some other offender has been responsible for the rape of, of, yeah. of this woman. Her head hair was actually found on the towel as well. Mm. Um, she may have had another client, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. in the same room. So Plus he's booked the room, though, pre-booked the room. You know, yeah. the preparation that he's got in a false name and false yes. details. Again, supportive to mm. his deviousness. And she's given a good description. Yes. Yeah. Um, so why would she Direct. make that up? And once we feel we've got a substantial case, then we'd have to sit down and look at the approach strategy um, to the victim. We've done some very basic inquiries about her lifestyle now. She seems to have a stable home in a new location. Clearly she'll be entitled to anonymity being a rape yes. complainant. So you might be able to reassure her. Um, one of the areas that does concern me is she's actually pregnant now. Right. And about seven months. But having said that, we'll be taking advice from professional people, yes. uh, from, from counsellors, about the best way to approach the victim. But the case still can't proceed without Jane's cooperation. So the way she's contacted is critical. Two months before Keane is arrested, they seek the advice of the experts from St Mary's. Phil down at the CPS is seeing this and thinks it's, um, there's a viable prosecution here. Obviously we need to case build. But a critical feature of the case is we need the support of the victim. Mm -hmm. Obviously what we need to determine is what's the best approach strategy. Yeah, I would prefer to do it in an environment that's disassociated with where she lives and where she's going to go back to. The last thing I want to do is upset her, certainly in her condition. Mm. She may see it as contaminating her current, current living... Current um, right? yeah, yeah, family, yeah. life, yeah. What is your time scale on it? Well, there's no time scale, but effectively, you know, we, we have a, a suspect who's out there. And I think really we've got to be seen to be moving as quickly yeah. as appropriately. Mm. As for the response from her, I'm not too sure. Obviously, after the initial shock, mm. I think that's the word I'd use. Um, she may give an emotional response, but it's critical, I think, certainly to go earlier rather than later. Yeah. In 1994, Jane was a drug addict who supported her habit by working the streets of Manchester. Now the police investigations reveal that she's left that life far behind. She's not working as a prostitute any longer. She's moved out of the Manchester area and we need to provide her with as much support as possible. That's one of the reasons why when we go to speak to her, we'll have a trained counsellor with us. We'll also stay in contact with her for the, the weeks and months ahead, leading up to the trial, hopefully, if she agrees to cooperate with us. I'd be extremely disappointed if she was to say that she didn't want to assist the police because she'd moved on. Um, however, I would understand that totally. The team now go to meet Jane to ask if she will be interviewed about the incident for the first time in ten years. I'm Detective Sergeant Meeks from Greater Manchester Police from the Cold Case Review Unit. Also present is... Gail Morgan, support worker from St Mary's Centre. And uh, what's your full name? I think I was numb. You know, I don't think I thought anything. Just that, God, no one knows about it. You know what I mean? And what do they want? <laughs> so I agreed to speak to them. Like I explained to you on the way here, I'm just going to ask you to read through the statement that you made in September 1994. Just refresh your memory as to the events that took place on that night. And then uh, once you've read through it... Making no commitment to give evidence against Keane, Jane agrees to a police interview with a support worker from St Mary's by her side. That was quite difficult because I know when we was actually going down to see her that particular day, uh, the police had told me that she was... Um, thinking about not going ahead with it because she was finding it really, really stressful. And up to her reading the statement, she still wasn't sure about what she was going to do. <clears throat> so it's quite a long statement, goes into a lot of detail about the attack on you that night and what happened. 
Um, how do you feel now reading that ten years on? What a great. Yeah. To actually sit down and read the statement, it brought everything back, you know, every detail. So it was pretty upsetting. <laughs> I'm definitely going ahead with it now. Yeah. You know, I've read the statement. Mm -hmm. I was in the right. What he did to me, he was in the wrong, and he needed punishing for it. And you know, in the last ten years, how many other girls has he done it to? And I think that's what made me go through with it. You know, I've come to be strong in the last few years, especially since I've come off drugs, and I'm. I know for a fact if I was still on drugs I wouldn't have done it. I really wouldn't have done it. So, you know, knowing that he was in the wrong and they found someone for it, I thought, yeah, why not? You know what I mean? He deserves to be punished for it. And so, one week later, Keane is finally arrested. Thanks to the combined efforts of the Forensic Science Service, the Cold Case Unit, and of course, Jane. I'm great to meet you, please. Come in and have a word. Great. False imprisonment, attempted public. You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you don't mention when questioned something which way to find court. 1994. 1994. Four, 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 four. Sir DS Andy Meek speaking from the cold case unit. I'm dealing with a prisoner, Brian Keane, who's been booked in this morning. Round at his house at the moment, doing a house search under warrant. Uh, while we've been doing the search, we've come across some keys to a unit, um, which is his business premises which could do with searching, so I could just do with a, a Section 18 authority from an inspector so we can uh, roll on and do it straight away. Keane is taken to Altrincham Police Station to be asked about his version of the events of that night. Ask him the direct question because of experience. The police call in a specialist to plan his interviews. I, I want to explore again exactly from when you picked her up to get into the hotel and ask him, where did you park your car? Yeah. Where, what was your intention when you went back? How long did you did you think you were going to be there? It'd be interesting to see what stance he takes, whether he speaks to us. You would expect, given the circumstances to it, that the might, he might well seek to try and advance a, a consensual I argument. Mm. I would be stunned if he goes completely not guilty, given the circumstances. I mean, there's enough there for him to orientate this current as a starting point. Yeah. 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 I find it uh, inconceivable that he will not remember taking uh, um, a working girl to uh, a hotel, unless it's a regular thing. So we'll look at the relationship with wife, any sexual dysfunction that he's, uh, he's suffered or he's received medical treatment for. Yeah, you see, normally what I would ask him is regularity of masturbation, because it's very common in rapists where they will fantasise about the act that they do. Preface it with, um, you know, look, what, what I'm going to ask you now is, is rather sensitive and um, I appreciate the sensitive nature of it, but nevertheless it's something that we need to ask. So just tee it up like that and then and go into it. Okay? Yeah. And like I say, if you feel that you want a break, you take a yeah. break. Go, I've then put you on. You, you dictate the face. <laughs> Tell me what your recollection of this incident is in September 1994. I cannot remember the girl's name. I can't remember what she looks like. Um, I didn't rape her. I didn't force her to do anything. Okay. But that evening wasn't the first time I'd met the girl. Okay. We were there on two prior occasions. On both of those occasions, we've gone to a house. The first time you picked her up off the street and you went back to her house, mm -hmm. what took place on I'd that night? We did have sex, yeah, but I can't remember um, how, lo how long we were there or okay. how so much I paid. That first meeting you had with her, some sort of sexual encounter took place, you can't remember exactly what, at her house. Yeah, I remember where he was, he was on the couch in the lounge, but on the evening that you're talking about, where I picked her up in the Wally Range area, she was stood on a corner, we went from there. A couple of hundred yards around the corner <coughs> to another house. A different 
in an estate and she wanted some money to buy drugs. And then we went to the hotel, that's where she took the drugs, basically. Yeah. I was trying to talk to her, trying to hurry her up. Um, and basically that went on for a couple of hours. Yeah. She said, I'll put on a show for you, which she did, sort of, Yeah. between the drugs. And then... So when you say she did a bit of a show on the bed, can you talk me through that, please, what exactly she did? Well, she got... It's quite important, this, that we um, yeah. go into a bit well, of she got underwear out. I, well, she got underwear out. I know she got underwear out. Um, didn't actually put it on at first. She took the underwear she had off and was messing about with this vibrator. Um, and putting cream on her and that. And after that, basically, she performed oral sex on me, and that was it. How many other prostitutes would you say you use the services of? Another one, that's it. Was that around this time? I really don't know, don't know, I don't remember. And where did you meet that prostitute? I can't remember. And where did you have sex with her? I really don't know. I can't remember. All right. OK, well, thanks for telling us that. Jane's version is very different. Working here was my spot. This was my pitch. You come up from Alexandra Park, and when he's got to about here, he's looked at me and nodded, and then started driving up slowly, thinking he was going to turn the next street, but he didn't. He turned on Manly. I mean, some of them park on the street you don't know, go right round and then park halfway up, and then flash the lights and then you'd walk up, but he drove this way, nodded, and I've walked up and gone up to his car, passenger side, got in, and off we went. I've always said to myself, if I don't feel comfortable with a punter, whether he's on foot or in a car, I'm not doing him. And I've always stuck by that rule, and with him, I was just relaxed. I asked him how long it would take to get there, he said 15 minutes there. Uh, 15 minutes back, so that was half an hour off the hour. So it was just half an hour in the room, and we agreed to it. Could build on him, but the main thing what I remember of him was potholes on his face you know, and bandage on his left hand. He did smoke a lot, but that was just like an actual thing, you know. Was he nervous doing business? That's the only thing you think of, you know. He, in my head, go to the hotel, do the business, and drop me back off. That's it. Not in your wildest dreams are you going to think, no, you're going to get to an hotel, and such a thing's going to happen. You've provided us in the course of this afternoon and this evening with an account of your version of what took place on that night. A detailed statement was obtained from the complainant at the time, and I'm going to run through now some of the things that she's told us. And I've got to say now, they differ vastly from the account that you've given to us. Okay, I'm going to go through some of those points now. Went up to the room, he already had the key. Not much conversation, but he asked me, did I want a cup of tea? And I've said, yeah, but I've ended up making it. I've used the toilet then, and I've come back out of the toilet, and I said, I thought you would, you know, be undressed by now, and he said, oh, I'm shy. He wasn't making me nervous at this time, or, you know, there was trust there. So I've bent down now. Um, going to take my shoes off. Then she says that you attacked her. Didn't attack her at all. And he's come behind me and grabbed me by the mouth. And he's got his hand over my mouth and holding me so I can't struggle. And he said, if you scream or shout, I'm going to knock you out the side, knock you on the side of your head and knock you out. No. At that point, you force her head down towards the cabinet, which is between the two beds in the hotel room. And took a piece of tape already cut to size behind the cabinet and put it across my mouth. No. And then? Took another piece of tape and put it across my eyes. No. Why should I do this? She's come there anyway. So she's got a blindfold on her, she's got a gag on her. You force her arms behind her back. He's tied my hands up then with a bandage at the back of her. So her arms behind the her bandage back. off my finger? From round your hand? No, it was on my finger. Well, I thought confirmed that. It was my finger. Not my hand. Oh, sorry, it was tied around my wrist. It was 
very scared and when you take it up and eyes full, blinded up and everything, you know, you, you can't see anything. She came to the room with me, her own free will, why should I do this? You took her off her knickers and her leggings. And then he's moved me to the chair and sat me on it and lifted my legs up onto the chair and untied my arms and then tied my arms and my ankles up together so my legs were spread right apart. Now this is rubbish, this is yeah. rubbish. And then he's gone back in the bathroom. He wasn't in there long. He's come back out with what I, at the time, didn't know what it was. It was some kind of cream. You then applied Imac cream to a pubic area. It's rubbish. She did when she was on the bed. I never, I never put any cream on her. Right. Do you know what Imac cream is? I don't know. Baby oil or something. I've used Imac cream on my legs before, and the smell is. You know, the smell of it. It's a depilatory cream. What it's used for is the removal of body hair. He's rubbing that all over my pubic parts. Left that on. For about 20 minutes. No. You then reapply the cream, leave it for some more time. And then you go back to her. No. And you use a warm... Damp cloth. Wiped it off. And then he mentioned that he was going to videotape what's going to happen. No. And you tell her that you're video recording the app. Oh, no. I don't think I was thinking anything, because you're that numb and scared. I thought I wasn't going to come out of this hotel room alive. And she says this wasn't a sort of a hurried attack. You seemed to be taking your time as if you were taking pleasure from taking your time. You had it under control throughout this time, and you knew exactly what no. you were doing. No. And he was saying again, you're not going anywhere until I finished. He has then gone back to the bed again and carried on himself. You're masturbating and then suddenly you push your penis into her mouth and ejaculate into her mouth. No. That isn't how it was. And he's wiped it all over a towel from the hotel room and come with a dank cloth and wiped my mouth with what he'd done in my mouth. That is not how it was. And then she says, eventually. He's um, took the tape off my eyes, so everything was still blurred, because four hours, you know, with tape on your, you, it's just dark when you take it off. He said, you can either stay the night or get a taxi home, but he was that calm, as if nothing happened at all. Everything that went on in that room was completely agreed with that. No, definitely didn't consent to anything that happened in that hotel room. Everything he did to me, he done it because he wanted to do it. Not because I've said, yes, I'll do it, you know what I mean? Or when we've got to the hotel, he's changed his mind and said, well, I don't want just straight sex, I want this. Nothing like that was said. We just went in the hotel room and he did what he wanted to do to me without me saying yes or no. The allegation that Keane videotaped the attack is of particular interest to the police. Three years earlier, he had been convicted of selling illegal pornography. The team are now very interested in the business he's been running for at least 14 years. They do what I call family videos, these, don't they? Yeah. Spain, Alfaro, 97. Disneyland, Paris. May 94. Who's Spain? Is they fair for Bondage. I said I was going to ask you some background questions, Brian, at the start of the interview. Can I ask you about your current method of employment? Yeah, I'm self employed. Can you tell me the nature of that business? Well, we, we sell adult DVDs. By mail order. And when you say adult, can you tell me about, about the contents of those DVDs? Adults, sex DVDs, yeah. So it's a fully legitimate business? Yeah. Okay. Have you got any sort of bizarre fetishes or unusual fantasies or no. predilections? No. no. Well, again, it depends what you call bizarre. Well, obviously, we've. Um, you know, you black misses sort of, uh, and suspenders, I mean, it's not. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, you mean the, the nature of your business that you're involved in? <laughs> well, that isn't me. I don't buy them. You. I sell them. And sell them he does, by the thousand. The 
police can't find one of the assault on Jane. It's absolutely filled with uh, DVDs, real sort of hardcore stuff, and loads of copying equipment as well. There's about six hard drives that I'm looking at now with all DVD drives on. Sorry? Um, doesn't appear to be anything child related which we've come across so far. Andy, I'm just thinking about taking these as a sample. Yeah, out of that box some. because of. Oh yeah. Obviously bondage. 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 Yeah, I you know. Shaved. Yeah. You say you know this is the stuff you deal yeah. in now. You're a major distributor of hardcore pornography. Major. I was yeah. going to call myself a major, I'm quite small time actually. Well, I've been around to a unit today at Stockport and it's filled with hardcore videos. I'm going to show you just a selection of some of the videos we've seized today. Yeah. Which just illustrates oh. my point that you are... Yeah, I knew you'd choose those, yeah. So if I just run through some of the titles for you. Uh, shaved and fucked. These are all... Yeah, but what you're failing to say, the, this is a tiny fraction of the stuff we sell. In actual fact, you won't find them, they've, they've not even gone on our brochure yet. But Anal fuckers. Yeah. Big tits bondage. Bondage lady boss. All depict graphic yeah. images of women being tied up. Yeah. Women being subjected to anal intercourse. But women, they're not mine. Women, I sell these. They're not mine. Women having the vaginal area shaved and so on. One there. There's no child pornography in Keane's lockup, so all this material is legal. But it hasn't always been so. There's no definition of obscene. There's no statutory definition of obscene. So with 11 years service in this field, I can't say whether something's obscene or not. It's entirely for a, mat a matter for the court to decide. It's kind of like now um, settled to a, a level whereby we would only prosecute something seriously if it, um, if it sort of tended to promote a criminal offence in itself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, rape videos, um, very heavy sadomasochistic videos, that type of thing, which are offences in themselves. Yeah. So if the video is saying that rape is good, well then that's obviously not right, is yeah. it? You know, yeah. we shouldn't be putting that sort of stuff mm -hmm. out to, the, uh, to anybody, really. And perhaps the most sinister element of all this, Brian, is that she says, while all this is going on, you're actually video recording the act. No. And you tell her that you're video recording the act. Oh, no. Why would I want to do that? Well, my personal opinion, based, as I say, based on my experience in the unit, is that there would have been a, a large market for it. Um, films with of simulated rape have always been, um, you know, top of the uh, the list, as it were. An actual rape today, and way back then, um, a homemade video showing an actual rape would have been very, very sore, mm. sought after. Yeah. An ordinary film would, would perhaps be 20, 30 pounds, mm. something like that. Something like, uh, a, a, you know, that type of film um, would have been 10 times that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Nineteen hours after his arrest, the Crown Prosecution Service decides there is enough evidence to charge Keane. Okay, Mr. Keane, you just uh, stand at the desk here. Hi, right, Brian Keane, you're charged with the following offences. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention now. Firstly, that on the 7th of September 1994, at the Pelican, Manchester Road, Timperley, you unlawfully and by force or fraud took or carried away a woman against her will, contrary to section of the common law. And that offence is one of kidnapping. Would you like to reply to that one? No. Keane is charged with kidnap false imprisonment, rape, attempted buggery, and two charges of indecent assault. Next day, he's granted bail. He must report to the police three times a week, but he can live at home with his family, and he's free to pursue his business interests until his trial.
things aren't quite the same for Jane. Things started flooding back to my head, you know, flashbacks and the worst part is me dreaming about I'm in the witness box and waking up having a wee. That was horrible, degrading. You know what I mean? I'm the victim and I was going through that a couple of nights of the week. I think anybody, regardless of, you know, a case from 10 years or 20 years ago, anybody who's been raped or sexually assaulted, to go to actually go to court and give evidence is the hardest thing, is the hardest thing to do because you are, you know, you are, you are the main witness, so you do get a hard time. Gail, she supported me through it. She was like my rock. If she wasn't there, I don't think I would have gone in the courts. You know, she was very, very helpful, very nice. I mean, she had my number if she wanted to speak to me at any time. And then, obviously, the nearer to the court case, it became more um, trying to sort of support her through, look, you know, just geeing her up, really, of, of to go in through the... to get her through the court case. The two weeks before the trial, that's when I started getting really nervous and butterflies and being sickly feeling. But I've gone so far now from the police coming to back out of it. Because there's a few times I wanted to phone him and say, listen, I can't do it. To make her appearance in the witness box less daunting, Jane is brought to Manchester for a pre-trial visit to the court where she will give evidence. Okay. This is court eight, so I'll just tell you first where everybody sits, okay. So this is the witness box where you'll give your evidence. The judge sits up there yeah. on the comfy seat. Yeah. This is the public gallery. You know, it's very small in these courts. So I don't know whether you've thought about whether you want to sit in the court after you've given your evidence. You're going straight home. You're going straight home, OK. But anybody who comes with you wants to sit in court, they can sit there. Mm. What you have to bear in mind, though, is the defendant will be sitting there yeah. and he will have an officer with him, but it's very close to the public gallery. Mm. And also any friends or family that come to support him on the day can also sit in these seats. Yeah. I believe someone from St Mary's might be coming with yeah, you on the day, OK? Yeah. So if you do want to have Gail in court, she'll sit here. Yeah, she We've obviously got Dr Roberts's photograph now. Yes. Um, do we have her copies of her notes of examination? The prosecution team, led by barrister Rachel Smith, are also preparing for their appearance in court. Now, videos. Um, what's your feeling about using the videos of his interviews instead of reading them? Parts of the interviews will be quite impactful, especially the, the last one. His demeanour changes completely, and there's certain times where he's really struggling, where he's obviously told a lie, and he's really struggling to sort of... Uh, support it. When we've given disclosure, you can see the points that he's concerned with and he's going to weigh in thoughts about them. When he's asked about any other prostitutes, he's <coughs> really bland because he doesn't think it's an issue. Oh yeah, I used another one. I, I, yeah, I took her in the car. And, and I, well, where was that? Who was she? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Very dismissive. And that's because he's not thought about it. Right. So this is the witness box. If looking at the defendant will put you off, mm. you need to just look straight ahead at the jury. Yeah. Mm. All anybody will ask of you is that you truth. tell the truth and it's that you answer the questions as best as you can. And if you can't remember something, it's OK to say. That's what I'm scared of as well, in case, you know, they go to one question and then further down the line they ask the same question but in a different way. There you know, shouldn't uh, be any trick questions, and that is what the judge is there, to make sure that nobody's trying to trip you up. Mm. What I've got to say, though, is sometimes with juries, if they find him, not guilty at the end of the trial, that doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't believe you. What that means is that the prosecution haven't been able to prove the case, mm. and there's a big difference there. It doesn't mean that they found him innocent, it just means that the prosecution couldn't prove that he was guilty. Put your faith in the system and hope for the best. If he said, I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about, I was never there, I don't know who this woman is, then that might be a different scenario. Yes but we're not in that situation. But I think singularly, from our own perspective, it's a different case to our other jobs under Operation Advance. And I always see this as an economic crime, as opposed yeah. to this sexually yeah. deviant crime. But he seems to put forward this defence of 
um, some type of breakdown in his relationship and that's why he sought the services of a, a prostitute to satisfy whatever means he had. Mm. But I still think this was to reinforce his economic position. He'd lost quite a bit when he'd been to court previously and got convicted and this was part of his start-up package again. On Monday the 19th of September 2005, six days after his 50th birthday, Brian Keane arrives at Manchester Crown Court to stand trial. I think you get a little bit apprehensive. We're a new unit. Um, it's one of our first cases we've taken to court. So I wouldn't say I was overly confident, but I know the work that the staff have put into the case. It's a good case. The standard of evidence is excellent. Um, we've got good legal representation. And, and I think, you know, putting that all together, I think we've got a real good chance of, of a successful outcome. Good morning. Um, you were going to have a little bit of a detail about the before we start, because there are various legal issues the judge has to decide. Um, it's pretty horrible waiting. Yeah. I think that's the worst thing. Yeah, it's just sitting here yeah. waiting for me to go up. Yeah. You'll forgive me for not coming to see you um, between now and when things come to their conclusion. You understand there are professional rules that mean that you and I don't speak apart from now. We'll have a chat about it when everything is over and done with. Yeah. The application for screens is not opposed, so there will be screens between yourself and the defendant. I don't want screens. You're okay without yeah. them, are you? I want, uh, no, I'm sure. the victim, I've done nothing wrong. You know? No, that's fine. I mean, we'll do whichever way, wh whatever you want. I don't want the screens. You sure? Yeah. Okay, well, that's fine. I'll notify the court then. All right. See you later. From that moment on, I'd never felt so scared and nervous inside I was really really crapping myself once they say they've come for you you know we're going now I mean that's when she she went she she got upset and she was um, shaking and she was I don't think I can do this I don't think I can do this and I'm sort of like cause you can cause you can and I think the worst thing about Manchester Crown Court is is the long walk it's a hell of a walk from the witness service to go to the court once I got in there and then I looked at him when I sat down I had to look at him just to let him know that I'm here because I should be here nothing had changed about him he'd just gone a bit older and a bit chubbier in the face but you know it was just like going through that hotel door more than a third of rape cases collapse at this point victims are often unable to face the ordeal of going into the witness box I take it as my personal responsibility to make sure the witnesses and the barristers are, are comfortable in court in order that they can do justice to themselves. Uh, a witness who is uh, not at ease um, can very well uh, find themselves saying something they don't intend to say. I thought it would be the judge who I was going to be nervous more of, but I wasn't. I was 100% relaxed with that judge. I couldn't ask for a better judge to sit on that trial. When I mentioned the dildo, he said, I, I think I know what a dildo is, but the jury, young day, might not. You know, it was funny, and I just felt really relaxed after he said that. You know, I could give me evidence and without thinking that it, no one's believing me. During Jane's cross-examination, Keane's lawyer asks her about the long list of convictions she received as a prostitute. But it's a risky tactic since it opens the door for the prosecution, who can now take the unusual step of telling the jury all about Keane's criminal past. The case is decided on relevant evidence, and the way a person has behaved in the past is not normally relevant, uh, and is potentially very prejudicial. And so traditionally, uh, in this country, we have said that evidence of a person's past offending is not something that is admissible. Uh, there are exceptions, uh, always have been exceptions to that rule. For example, if he asks questions about prosecution witnesses or makes suggestions about prosecution witnesses which suggest that they have a bad character, uh, then of course his character, um, he's calling the, it's the pot calling the kettle black if you like, is by statute admissible. 
By the time he's driven away after giving evidence on the sixth day of the trial, the jury have learnt the full extent of Keane's criminal record. 24 convictions for everything, from indecent assault to crimes of violence. With the evidence heard, all the prosecution team can do is wait and hope. I think we just have to leave it now with the judge and the jury. You know, we just have to wait and see. I mean, I think everything we wanted to happen happened and nothing we didn't want to happen happened. So I'm not sure that he came across brilliantly. No, far from it, in parts anyway. But um, very curious experience with the jury then. Yeah. Couldn't read it, couldn't read the jury at all. Right. So I think we've kind of done everything we've got to do. Yeah. On Tuesday the 27th of September 2005, 11 years after the attack on Jane, Brian Keane returns to court to hear the judges summing up and await the jury's verdict. Advances in DNA technology identified Keane as a suspect. But only the jury can decide his guilt. I'm just waiting for a phone call. You know, how long are the jury going to be out for? Are they going to be out for a couple of hours? Are they going to be out a day? That was the most waiting for that phone call. Um, doing things in the flat what I've already done four times over. You know, washing clothes, what don't even need washing. <laughs> Just waiting for the phone call. And every time the phone rang and it wasn't the police. Right, I've got to go now, you know, I'm waiting for a phone call. Are you all right? Yes, yeah, good news. Good. Uh, still in the court building. Can you hear me all right? It's a bit of a crackly line again, isn't it? Yeah. The uh, jury went out about 12 o'clock. Yes. Yeah. Just come back now. Yeah. Guilty. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, fucking brilliant. On all counts, so... Has he been sentenced yet? No, he's going to get sentenced first thing in the morning. Oh, so. that's brilliant, and... Uh, Excellent result, isn't it? I've been biting my nails like hell all afternoon. So have I. You should have been down here, bloody hell. Oh, <laughs> Jesus, that's brilliant. So, yeah, guilty of the lot, so... The lot? Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. So, well done you, anyway, for being brave enough to come down and everything. Right, okay. Oh, so how long do you think you'll get, Andes? Is he looking at a sentence? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. What um, do you think? I wouldn't like to say, to be honest with you, but I certainly think it'll be, you know, upwards of uh, upwards of five years, I would have thought, probably. Five upwards? Upwards, yeah, anything. I just don't know. I wouldn't like to say, oh. to be honest with you, better off waiting until tomorrow, but it'll certainly be a custodial sentence. Oh, that is brilliant. That is the best news I have heard, yeah. Under. yeah. I really thought... Yeah, I knew it would be 50-50, but I really thought he was going to be majority yeah. not guilty. And the judge said to the jury that, that he thought they'd made the right decision as well, so... Yeah, so it's excellent news. Oh, God, my heart is off. So... Say thanks, Andy, thanks very much, because, you know, without you and Gail, I don't think I would have gone through it. Oh, so he's going, to get, he's going to get sentenced at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, so I'll let you know straight away in the morning. Alright, really nice. right, we'll have a few drinks tonight because I certainly will be doing. <laughs> Alright, cheers. I'll speak to you tomorrow. See you, bye. Absolutely ecstatic. There's lots of cheering going on in the background, so all the family are with her as well, so they're absolutely over the moon. It's all fantastic, yeah. What about you? Yeah, it's, um, it's been a very tense afternoon, <laughs> so I'm still feeling a little bit shell shocked at the moment. But the right result. Phoned me mum, I phoned everybody. <laughs> Must have been on the phone for about an hour phoning everybody. That was a relief for me, knowing that he got guilty and the juror and the judge believer. For the first time since being released on bail, Brian Keane will spend the night not at home in Wilmslow, but in Her Majesty's prison, Manchester. The next morning, Judge Hammond describes his actions in the Pelican Hotel as abuse, humiliation and degradation. He sentences him to 12 years in prison.
that his victim, though, has one final act before she can put behind her the events of September 1994 for a second time. I've got a sickly feeling. We're near there. I can't picture anything, you know. Somewhere. I just see myself walking through the car park. And just all come back. If I can remember right where the, the door we went through is right where near that fan is. As soon as I see in the car park, I just see myself walking up with him. And just all come back. I feel angry because I want to go to the room. Do you know what I mean? I do really want to go to the room. So I can just, you know, put it through my head one more time and say to myself, he's been punished, he's in jail now, 12 years. I can bury it then and just get on with my life and try not to think about it anymore. Operation Advance has given the cold case unit nearly 50 new cases, but they'll never forget their first success. One of the real annoying things about sexually motivated crimes is right away the spotlight appears to be on the victim. She was chosen as a victim because of her vulnerability by the nature of her activity in prostitution. So to me, she's no different from being an elderly person, um, a young person, someone with some mental disability. One of those people that we can readily identify as vulnerable groups. To me, prostitution is no different. And all I'd ask for people is not to judge people on their status in life, just to judge them on being a victim. It now, I've gone to the room, and hopefully, I can bury it now. Emotional, very emotional. Let a few tears out, but it was just like the night, just going through the car park. The room looked smaller, it looked like the night, it, it felt bigger. And the beds were closer in than they was on the night. I didn't think I could do it, and I'm glad I've done it. We're going on. Right, we'll start on a review of Operation Advanced Cases. Do you want to run off with them? Then Andy. There was a young girl walking home from a night out in December 1990. Um, a stranger ate. We've got the full DNA hit on that. Girl walking home from a night out in Manchester, dragged into a park. Full DNA profile obtained. The offender's not on the database. 22-year-old girl who's walking a dog subjected to indecent assault. 13-year-old girl who made a complaint she was raped. Which again, we've got the DNA hit against the named person. Next one, girl had a gun put to her head, July 1993. She was a prostitute who was subjected to the horrendous indecent assault. Um, got a full DNA profile. We've ready to go to the CPS with her. 1995. She was dragged onto some waste ground and raped. So she had a contraceptive sponge. The sponge is still in existence. I believe further work is ongoing to try and extract a profile from the sponge material. If you've been affected by any of the issues in tonight's programme and would like to talk to someone for support or information, then call the BBC Action Line 08000 934 999. All calls are free and confidential.